Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's briefing on the escalated tensions between the U.S. and Iran. Today's briefing will address Iran's potential responses to the recent U.S. airstrikes, as well as possible security implications for the region. So with that, we'll get started. Our first speaker is Fahim Masood. Fahim is a regional intelligence manager here at WorldAware and serves on our Middle East and North Africa team. Prior to immigrating to the United States in 2008, Fahim worked as a linguist and cultural advisor for the United States Army in Afghanistan. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Fahim. Thanks for joining us today. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, uh, Katie. Uh, what I would like to do is to focus on four questions that I think are pretty significant. And those questions are, who was Qasim Soleimani and why is his death so significant? Was the trigger for killing him Iran's options in terms of retaliatory responses. And then finally, the fallout from the US action and some of the regional security implications. Now, before I get started, there have been a few changes uh, changes since we gave this webinar yesterday. Iran launched uh, missiles at two Iraqi bases, which are housing US troops last night. Um, we will get to what those strikes mean and uh, then answer uh, if there are any questions pertaining to uh, these missile strikes. Major General Qasem Soleimani uh, was the commander of Iran's Quds Force. It is the external wing of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, also known as the IRGC. And the Quds Force, or also known as uh, Nirui Quds in Farsi, focuses on its special and covert operations outside Iran. Soleimani was the main architect of the country's military policies and played a central role in Tehran's activities in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. He was also Iran's most formidable military commander and Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei's favorite general. Um, Soleimani was also the second most important political figure in the country. Yes, he was a military commander, but in terms of his influence in the, in the country, he was second only to the Supreme Leader. Soleimani's death on January 3rd came a few days after hundreds of Shia militia supporters stormed the US embassy in, in Baghdad, which prompted the United States to deploy additional security forces to the region and also to the embassy. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has justified the killing of Soleimani on the grounds that he was planning further attacks on American assets in Iraq and in the wider region. Soleimani's death makes a significant escalation obviously in US-Iran tensions in the region. The trigger for recent events was a rocket attack on the K-1 air base in Kirkuk, which killed an American defense contractor on December 27. The US had hailed Katayeb Hezbollah, an Iranian-backed Shia militia group, but distinct from the Lebanese Hezbollah militant group, responsible for the rocket attack and conducted airstrikes against the group's military bases in both Iraq and Syria on December 29. These airstrikes killed over 20 members of the group. The ultimate meaning of Soleimani's death remains a matter of worldwide speculation. Though it's fair to say that no other actor influenced events in the Middle East to the extent that Soleimani did in the last two decades. While a significant number of Iranians despised their government, Soleimani enjoyed widespread reverence and popular admir admiration. His death is already serving as a uni unifying issue for Iranians of all political, religious, and ethnic backgrounds. Massive rallies on January 5th in Evaz in Iran's Khuzistan province, which is home to Iranian Arabs, and has been a key site of anti-government protests, illustrate this. Soleimani is credited with protecting the Shia shrines from the onslaught of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and defeating the group. His death is also the most consequential political event in the Middle East since the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, and will likely prove to be a watershed moment in the history of the region. It will also prove to be one of the most destabilizing events. Soleimani had himself told Iraqi and Syrian militias that President Trump would never attack him 
as his death would mean direct war. Now, whether his prediction proves to be true will depend on a number of things, um, including what follows um, uh, next. Iran has responded uh, and had said that it would respond. Um, Khamenei, of course, has offered predictably hostile rhetoric in the wake of the killing, saying that severe vengeance awaits the United States, while several IRGC commanders have also threatened Israel and um, its cities. Uh, mourners have also chanted anti-Saudi slogans uh, during the past few days' rallies. The one certainty following Soleimani's death was an Iranian response. This is no surprise given that, again, Iranian officials, including Hossein Dehan, Khamenei's senior military commander and Iran's for, uh, former defense minister, is strongly indicated that Iranian forces would target U.S. military bases directly. Dehan also said that the only thing that could end this period of war was for the Americans to receive a blow that was equal to the blow they had inflicted on Iran, and then they, meaning the U.S., should not seek a new cycle. What followed early January 8, late January 7, was over a, do a dozen milit uh, Iranian ballistic missiles, which targeted Ain al-Assad Air Base in Al Anbar Province and Harir Air Base in Erbil Province of Iraq. These are not, of course, American bases, but military bases, which are again housing U.S. troops. They strike were a calculated response on the part of Tehran to avoid a full-blown conflict with the U.S. I believe that Iran is done with retaliating directly. Iranian Foreign Minister Jawad, Zarif, Jawad Zarif's statement in the immediate aftermath of the event has made this abundantly clear. The evolution of the conflict now appears to be in the U.S. hands. Absent a major U.S. military response, which currently appears unlikely, given that there were no American casualties, the situation will remain tense, but a full-blown conflict will likely be averted. Now, Iran has an array of options to respond to the U.S. and its allies if tensions were to escalate. Missiles and conventional warfare and cyber powers constitute the core of Iranian military capabilities, and the country will likely use these if conflict were to break out. In the absence of a modern air force, Iran has been developing ballistic missiles to discourage its regional enemies, Israel and Saudi Arabia, as well as the United States from launching attacks against it. Iran has the largest missile arsenal in the Middle East with a significant inventory of close range, short range and medium range ballistic missiles with a distance of 2000 kilometers. Additionally, Iran operates coastal defense missiles along its southern coast that can strike military or commercial ships up to 300 kilometers away. The country is also armed with pretty sophisticated drones. Iran's asymmetric warfare capabilities are used to prop up the country's regional allies as well as to retaliate against Iran's enemies. Iran can employ the Shia militias it has cultivated in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and in Lebanon. Given Iran's weaknesses in its conventional forces, it has heavily relied on its proxies to advance its national interests and to maintain plaus de de plausible deniability. The other core cap military capability of Iran is its cyber warfare capabilities. Since 2009, Iran has invested significant resources to develop capabilities for propaganda, intelligence exploitation, and disruption purposes. Cyber operations are low cost, which enable the country to collect information and to retaliate against its adversaries. Iranian cyber assailants regularly phishing and defacing campaigns against businesses, defense companies, energy and oil corporations. Several U.S. government officials have stated in 2018 that Iran had laid the groundwork for widespread cyber attacks against the U.S. and European infrastructure. Iran has the capability to enable denial of service attacks against numerous electrical grids, water plants, and private corporations against the US, Europe, and the Middle East. Iran is also suspected of having carried out several cyber attacks against Saudi companies and government agencies in recent years. Even more significant is that Iran has markedly 
improved its capabilities to the point that they are now on par with those of China and Russia. On January 4th, cyber actors claiming to be from Iran defaced the US Federal Depository Library's um, website. Similar attacks against US defense companies and government agencies remain likely. The immediate fallout from the US airstrike has been most concrete in Iraq. Beyond the large rallies honoring Soleimani in Baghdad, there have been demonstrations outside an oil field in Basra demanding the withdrawal of US oil workers from the country. Rocket attacks have been reported against multiple bases housing US troops, including Balad Air Base and the International or Green Zone. Iraqi militias have warned Iraqi security forces to stay away from US bases. The US, the UK, and several other governments have urged their citizens to avoid travel both to Iraq and to Iran. Anti-US demonstrations have also been occurring in cities in Pakistan, Lebanon, Yemen, and several other parts of the region. The impact from such actions is primarily associated travel and transport disruptions, but clashes are also possible. Future actions will likely occur at US embassies, consulate, consulates, and companies. Iran may also retaliate against oil tankers and vessels in the Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz, which will result in maritime disruptions. To mitigate this, the British Royal Navy has already deployed ferry gates to escort oil tankers in the Strait of Hormuz, which is a crucial waterway between the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. It's also the world's busiest maritime oil traffic route. Some 90% of Gulf countries' oil exports transit through the strait. While Iran likely does not have the means to close this strait entirely, it can harass and attack civilian commercial vessels, which will severely impact maritime operations in the, Gulf, in the Persian Gulf and contribute to a significant increase in global energy prices. Now, the United States formed a naval coalition in uh, August of 2018, and that is definitely likely to mitigate this threat in the Persian Gulf somewhat. Given the high tensions, the US military, as well as the armed forces of several countries throughout the Middle East have been placed on high alert. Countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Israel, which have been targeted with drones and missiles in the past, will almost certainly heighten security postures throughout their major cities, sensitive military bases, and key infrastructure sites. In spite of the Iranian retaliation early January 8, I would like to emphasize that a conventional war with Iran does does not appear likely at the moment. This is mainly because the Iranian regime wants to survive. It's not suicidal, and because its conventional weaponry and equipment are pretty outdated. And obviously for economic reasons, the US sanctions have pretty much paralyzed the country's economy. And that concludes my remarks. Katie, back to you, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Fahim. That was a really good background information. And thanks for including the developments from overnight. Uh, let's now talk about what organizations uh, who have that have operations in the region should be considering. We have Tony Roccaforte joining us today. Tony is a senior security advisor here at WorldAware on our global assistance and response team. Prior to this role, Tony worked as a senior intelligence analyst, uh, and he focused mostly on political violence and armed conflict. Tony is also a veteran of the U.S. Army Special Forces. Thanks for joining us today, Tony. What sorts of considerations should organizations operating in the region be thinking about right now? All right. Thanks, Katie. Thanks to Fahim, too. From a security perspective, the main takeaway here is that a lot of the second and third order effects of this thing are going to be difficult to predict. So. Organizations operating in the Middle East need to be preparing for every contingency, not only those operating in central and southern Iraq, but in Lebanon, Israel, in the Palestinian territory, Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, parts of eastern and southern Saudi Arabia, uh, as well as you know any other pockets of the region where U.S. and Iran, as well as each side's proxies and allies, are competing for influence. Um, a few quick points right off the bat. In Central and Southern Iraq specifically, World Aware is advising clients operating in the region to start formulating an exit strategy and consider evacuating non-essential personnel. 
Ideally, organizations should plan to depart while commercial air is still available. Also, make sure your people are staying well informed of any significant developments in the region. Understand what normal looks like in your environment so you can quickly identify any significant shifts from that baseline. Liaise with World Aware through the Access to Analyst program. Monitor your internal message traffic and communicate with local contacts daily to ensure you have the most up-to-date information as the situation unfolds. You want to brace for an increased security posture in the region as well, particularly in border areas and in those pockets I mentioned earlier. If confronted by security forces, comply with all instructions immediately and do not attempt to bypass any security checkpoint for any reason. Even an accidental breach of the security cordon near a checkpoint could prompt security forces to respond aggressively, possibly with deadly force. Westerners, um, Americans particularly, need to maintain a low profile. Consider working from home or a hotel. Try to dress inconspicuously. Avoid discussing details of your itinerary in public. Avoid discussing politics. Vary routines and routes daily um, to include using different entrances and exits of, of the buildings that you use if, if possible. Um, additionally, always verify onward transportation before checking out of any accommodations. If you have to move, try to minimize nighttime movement and try to move in groups of at least four people. Map several routes that circumvent known flashpoint areas and track your location at all times in relation to where we, where you started and, and where you need to go. Um, mo moving on. Personnel in the region should also register with their embassy in their area of operation if they have not already done so. However, Personnel, particularly Americans and other Western expats, should minimize unnecessary movement near their diplomatic missions in the region until the situation stabilizes. Similarly, ensure that your organizations are developing evacuation and shelter in place plans that do not, I say again, do not require government or diplomatic assistance. Uh, more about that in a minute. Have your people in the region pack a go bag now as well, so they're ready to move at a moment's notice. Go bags need to have all key identification, important contact information and travel documents, credit cards and cash, ideally enough to sustain them for at least a 96 hour travel period. Any required medication with, the, with their physician's prescription, spare eyeglasses, extra communications devices and power supplies, high energy snacks, bottled water, water treatment, and uh, a flashlight with extra batteries, maybe a small hygiene kit or a trauma kit and, and some rain gear. Once a go bag is packed, leave it packed, but make sure your people are keeping all backup communications devices and power supplies fully charged. If you haven't already done so, get accountability of your people in the region now. You need to make sure you know exactly where all of your people are located and you, in the event you need to steer assets to their location or, or coordinate some kind of evacuation on their behalf. Don't rely on an itinerary that was submitted six months ago. Confirm that your people are still where they said they would be. Um, also, build out your communication plan if you haven't already done so. When building a comms plan, remember the acronym PACE primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. Redundancy is vital to pretty much all aspects of a security plan, but it's especially important when critical aspects of that plan involve electronic devices. Obviously, local landlines, email servers, cell networks, and radio platforms spanning multiple frequency bands should serve as primary and alternate methods of communication. However, in areas without network coverage, um, in areas that are beyond the range of relay stations, or if certain communication frequencies are jammed for whatever reason, a satellite phone or a two-way GPS messaging device or a personal locator beacon may be your only option. Try to designate communications windows for safety check-ins as well and establish clear escalation procedures for when those windows are missed. Um, make sure you have a plan in place that includes mechanisms to conduct physical wellness checks of your people in the event electronic comms are are disabled or ineffective for whatever reason. You also need to ensure that you have clear thresholds and, and procedures um, for, for activating uh, emergency contact notification. Organizations should also consider using World Aware's mass notification tools to relay any pertinent information to your people in the area. Um, drilling down a bit 
for some of the clients working in some of the more restive areas in the region. Ensure that you have robust evacuation and shelter in place incident management plans in place. When developing EVAC IMPs, our intent is to try to ensure the evacuation is done as gracefully and as economically as possible. Ideally, we want to take a phased approach to any evacuation. So we aimed to draft our EVAC plans with specific indicators and triggers and clear instructions for all impacted personnel in every phase. When drafting the EVAC plan, we need to ensure that we have clear personnel accountability procedures, hence the importance of a robust communications plan I, I mentioned earlier. We also need to have a robust transportation plan. So keep your vehicles prepped and staged at all times. Uh, that means fully fueled, equipped with a spare tire and jack, fire suppression equipment, comms, trauma kits, and water. Um, ensure multiple assembly areas and evacuation points have been identified, uh, as well as mapped and validated as viable safe havens for your people. Uh, and make sure everyone in your organization is briefed on the location of those sites. Make sure you have enough vehicles and trained drivers to transport everyone within your organization and their essential belongings to those assembly areas or evacuation points. Uh, again, pace. If, if you know, a vehicle in your convoy breaks down, do you have a contingency plan to crossload personnel and their luggage, or are all your vehicles already overloaded? Uh, similarly, if no driver is available or if the driver is injured, is there any is, is there anyone else in the vehicle who can take the wheel? Um, we also need to identify any areas of potential congestion or in alternate routes. So. If the situation deteriorates rapidly in some areas, security forces or even protesters may close down main roads or restrict access to, to key air, restrict access to to airports, for instance. So it's absolutely essential that we have alternate routes mapped out ahead of time and enough fuel in our vehicles to drive that route if we have to if we have to circumvent a potential choke point. Um, one more note on evac planning if you are planning to write uh, charter aircraft into your plan keep in mind that the payload capacity on some of the smaller birds is extremely limited you want to bring your go bag for sure but be prepared to leave behind all non-essential gear um, a few points on shelter in place options now when devising shelter in place plans, ensure that we have an adequate supply of potable water, ideally one gallon of drinking water per person per day, as well as high energy shelf stable foods, ideally 1500 to 3000 calories worth per person per day. We also need to ensure that we have adequate toiletries and other personal hygiene items for all impacted personnel. We need medical supplies, trauma kits, AEDs, uh, as well as people who are trained to use that kind of equipment. If people are taking prescription meds, we need to have a plan in place to ensure they have a steady supply in the event of a prolonged shelter in place. Um, same with same with eyeglasses. Uh, again, redundancy is is key here. So, like we did for comms and transportation, we want to think pace for for water, food, medical, and fuel resupply. If if you're planning to shelter in place, regardless of the course of action taken, continuous threat analysis, timely decision making and prior planning are absolutely essential here. Uh, yes, the old adage that no plan survives first contact is very applicable, but it's far better to have a framework in place so we're not relying entirely on ad hoc mitigation. World Aware is here to assist organizations with analysis as well as drafting, testing, and implementing plans and procedures, but ultimately each organization is responsible for deciding on their own courses of action. Uh, on a similar note, and I did touch on this earlier, um, organizations should be careful to avoid relying too heavily on diplomatic missions overseas to secure your people in these types of situations. Unless your organization is working directly in support of the government, their, any government, their diplomatic mission overseas may not be able to offer much assistance if, if the situation deteriorates. So the bottom line there is make sure you have plans in place that do not require government assistance. Uh, and with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you all today, and I'm going to pass it back to Katie. Thanks again. Great. Well, this has certainly been a really dynamic conversation today, especially given uh, the latest developments. 
Thank you again to Fahima Tony for sharing all of your incredible knowledge and insight. I'm so glad we have you on our team. And to our listeners today, thank you for taking time out of your schedules to tune in for this really important topic. Also, feel free to head over to our website to access additional information and support resources on the topic. Uh, we'll keep our, our website updated with information as it's available. On behalf of our World Aware team, thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.